Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. Today's interview is a follow-up to last month's show on birding. Going beyond how we can enjoy birds, today we'll focus on how we can help birds. Our guest is Will Weber, owner of the travel company Journeys International, lifelong birder, and chair of the Hawk Migration Association of North America, who will be talking with us about bird conservation. Welcome to the show, Will. Thank you, Barbara. So I'm going to start out being devil's advocate. Now, when I look outside and I've um, filled the bird feeder, I'll get hundreds of house sparrows. And in the fall, I'll look up at the sky and I'll see a flock of thousands of some type of blackbird. Now, don't we have enough birds already? Well, some kinds of birds, we have too many. And maybe house sparrows and starlings, uh, some people would say uh, other species as well, have maybe exceeded what we would consider uh, reasonable limits. Uh, but many species are really threatened, and you could make the argument that we have far too few of them, too few to ensure their continued survival. And how do birds help our ecosystems, for instance? Well, there's a, a, a number of ways. Certainly they beautify it. Um, the reasons people put bird feeders in the yard is to enjoy that bit of natural beauty, uh, the bird song. But also they're important in eating weed seeds and insects. Uh, particularly things like swifts and swallows. Even hummingbirds eat insects that we might find uh, obnoxious and uh, help keep the balance in our, in our garden and in our, in our environment. Mm -hmm. And do they provide um, prey? I mean, they're, let's see, they're food for other birds, right? So they're part of... Certainly they are. Uh, many of hawk species, raptor species, eat smaller birds. Mm -hmm. um, there are other mammal predators that eat birds, sometimes uh, pets that we would rather not eat birds yeah. eat birds. <laughs> so if we didn't have birds, would our web of life be able to survive? Uh, birds, in many cases, are important pollinators for plants. Um, clearly, they do maintain a certain balance with their food supply. They distribute seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a wild cherry is predominantly spread by birds that eat the berries and then spread the seeds through the droppings. So they're definitely an integral part. We would miss them aesthetically as well as functionally in the environment. So those are threats to, um, those are problems with the habitat, food, water, and shelter. Um, so let's talk about that, what we need to do to maintain those things that birds need. What are some really important things for maintaining habitat for birds? On a broad scale, supporting wildlife conservation areas and uh, green spaces, uh, protecting areas of natural environments that birds use to nest, um, not just here in our area, but to the south, Central and South America, where they migrate, they need these nesting areas. Many of them go out into the islands in the Caribbean where habitat is ever diminishing. So protecting habitat is one thing. Protecting the food supply by uh, avoiding uh, use of too many chemicals in the environment that sterilize it effectively, keep the insects down, depletes the food supply for birds. Um, planting invasive species often takes away the natural habitat that, peop that birds would use to, to nest. So there's a, a variety of ways that we can pr protect birds. The more we know about them, the more we care about them, the more we appreciate them, the more there's a constituency for conservation as well when it comes time for Congress or the legislature to decide to allocate money that might specifically benefit birds. You mentioned a lot of interesting things in that. Um, how about the um, global issues? I, I know you travel a lot with your job, and um, there's issues with, for instance, coffee plantations, how coffee's grown. What's that all about? There's a movement to encourage people to buy shade-grown coffee. Uh, coffee, in its most uh, corporate, large-scale form, farm is, uh, form is grown in large fields, monoculture, much like you'd see a cornfield here in Brazil. You would go and you'd see endless rows of coffee. And it's sprayed, hearth chemicals, both on the plants and in the soil. Nothing but coffee <laughs> lives in those vast fields. People some years ago realized that more traditional, less intensive coffee growth in much of Central and South America 
actually benefited birds. In fact, there are some species of birds that were discovered to be living in the trees that grew above the coffee groves. And shade-grown coffee is uh, less efficient. It takes a little longer to produce, but it really does benefit the birds because it's not about just one plant. It's about an ecosystem uh, that surrounds the coffee. And so by buying shade-grown coffee, you're, in a sense, encouraging farmers who practice this form of agriculture. And farmers here in the United States, you mentioned there's something uh, called a reserve program that um, there's uh, questionable funding for with the Farm Bill. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, one of the ways we've maintained the supply of food was to pay farmers to set aside certain land. Often this was wet areas, which would be nesting habitat for ducks, or or grassy areas, which are important habitat for a variety of field nesting birds that really depend on this kind of fallow land. But with intensifying agriculture, the increasing prices of corn, and the lack of support for these programs, more and more land has come into intensive agricultural use, and that dramatically has diminished the habitat that a lot of these species depend on. Do you think um, raising biofuels has, the push for biofuels has affected birds at all? I'm not really an expert on that, but I do understand that um, the number of acres in corn <laughs> has been taken partly from that reserve program. And so I know there are people who are strong critics of biofuels, particularly corn and ethanol. Um, I, but I, I think surely if you convert something into just producing one crop like corn, it's taking away habitat that might provide for a more varied ecosystem. I came across a U of M study that said that uh, out in the prairie states, a third of the birds uh, have declined because of biofuel raising. So that, that got me wondering about it. Well, species like bobolinks and meadowlarks, uh, even bluebirds, a large number of sparrow species really have been declining in recent years. And one of the reasons is fewer places where it's a natural prairie environment or a natural grassland environment. That reminds me, bobolinks. We had a um, farm field when I was growing up and we always had bobolinks. Mm -hmm. And one year my dog flushed out a bird and it was a bobolink and yes. we never had bobolinks nest there again. <laughs> so that was really a disappointment to me. Yeah, I think one reason we don't have more ground nesting birds in our city parks is because people like to let their dogs off leash. They may see the sign there that says all animals must be unleashed, but there seems to be some irresistible desire to give that animal its 10 minutes of freedom. And uh, they'll find woodcocks and sparrows and meadowlarks that nest on the ground in grassy areas and it are killed here. Uh, and it's unfortunately not favorable to the birds. <laughs> you mentioned uh, pesticide use. Now, I know, you know, buying organic food and such will help decrease the pesticide use in our environment in general, in agricultural fields, but also in our yards, is it important to try to stay away from pesticides? Well, I know now there's an effort to use pesticides that uh, lose their potency quickly or have low toxicity to uh, more complex organisms to begin with. But if you're eliminating insects from your yard, um, if you're killing the grubs in the grass, you're probably also killing the earthworms that the robins, for example, would depend upon. Mm -hmm. So you won't increase the number of birds by using pesticides mm -hmm. around your yard, almost certainly. It reminds me, I, I visited the Bird Center of Washtenaw, and they were saying how the, um, there's less um, fruit this year because of the cold snap we had in the spring, and that more birds are relying on insects this year. And uh, so I kind of making the connection that maybe with uh, pesticides impacting insects, that could be even harder on birds. Um, I, I think it is. A lot of birds uh, call them omnivorous, where they eat fruit when it's available, but insects if the fruit isn't. Um, and the whole uh, way that our climate seems to be shifting, unexpected cold or warm spells, really must be very confusing to birds because they're used to a much more predictable progression of the seasons and warming and cooling through the seasonal cycle of spring and summer and fall. And you get these dramatic changes. Uh, I think a lot of people are quite concerned. It's confusing birds' sense of time to migrate. 
Um, they're looking for a certain kind of food at a certain time of year in a certain place, and when it's not there, it, it, it must be a stressful thing. Yeah, the Bird Center people mentioned that the uh, wild grape crop this year, it's, it's not a crop because it's wild, but I, I did notice there's a fence in my neighborhood that's normally covered mm -hmm. with wild grapes this time of year, and I looked in it and there's not a single grape there, and, and they were at the Bird Center where they do rehab for birds. They have to ship in champagne grapes from oh, California right. to feed these birds. How about food in, that we would provide out in the bird feeders? Is that an important thing? Do you think that some people are afraid to do it because they might go on vacation and then the birds would be dependent on them and, and not have food? Um, I think it's fairly evident that the uh, population of songbirds that are seed eaters has risen pretty dramatically in urban areas around the country because people feed birds. Oh, birds great. like goldfinches, uh, cardinals, blue jays, certain woodpeckers, nuthatches, um, really do enjoy a pretty good living in urban areas where people feed birds. I don't think that if one person stops feeding, it's necessarily critical uh, to the birds. They'll find their way. They have survived without bird feeders for many years. Uh, here in Ann Arbor, for example, so many people feed birds. There's always another feeder the birds the birds could go to. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, this, this time of year they're finding feeders and they're developing habits uh, for suet or peanut butter or mealworms or uh, sunflower seeds. Those are all favorite foods of birds. Okay. How about deadwood? I know that um, that can create shelter for birds and there's a tendency to want to take down deadwood. Yeah. Uh, provides nesting cavities. Uh, for birds. Um, woodpeckers, nuthatches uh, definitely prefer looking for um, uh, insects in dead wood over, over live wood. Uh, and when it does fall, it often creates shelter in a yard or in a, in a wood lot. Um, it used to be that uh, we had certain species like bluebirds that would nest in um, old cavities. Um, or another example is chimney swifts, where uh, now, bluebirds are almost wholly dependent on bird houses because there are so few of these cavities in the kind of habitat where they nest. And, and chimney swifts, as the name implies, nest in, in chimneys rather than the hollow trees that they used to nest in. There are just fewer <laughs> big, dead, hollow trees left around. Hmm. Yeah, again, at the Bird Center of Washington, they had some chimney swift babies that had fallen out of a nest within a chimney, and they were rehabilitating them and mm -hmm. let them go after they had raised them to a healthy size. Well, I think when we create structures that birds then use, we do have an obligation to, to follow up and do everything we can to see that their attempt at nesting is successful. So if you have a birdhouse for bluebirds, for example, it's a good idea to check that birdhouse to see that insects haven't come in. There are certain insects that would parasit parasitize the bluebirds or tree swallows if you have tree swallows in the house. Um, or house sparrows. I hear or they ho house sparrows are real predators on baby mm -hmm. birds. Mm -hmm. yeah. You said you sometimes feed mealworms to bluebirds on your windowsill? I, I, I do, and I enjoy it. They'll, it will bring them right up to the window. If you have bluebirds around, if you put a little feeder on your window, sometimes the stick-on type feeders, bluebirds, especially in winter, just love mealworms. Hmm. You can convince them to stay around. Normally, they would go farther south, but uh, I met a local lady that, her name's Mary Morand, and she raises mealworms, and she feeds bluebirds at her windowsill. And we have a clip of that. I'd like to oh. show that. Oh, good, good. I'll show that now. Their names are Rayland and Winona. <laughs> they're swooping because they're a little okay. nervous. Okay. Here are the beetles, and they don't fly. Oh my goodness. And then, um, they lay eggs, and the eggs hatch, and you get tiny little worms like this, and then they grow into bigger worms like this. Then they go into a stage, if I can see one here, the little pupa it is. And then that hatches into a beetle, and they lay eggs and start the cycle over. and they feed the babies and they'll come back up here and they'll come right in.
but we don't want to scare them. Right. They, and they might fly around in the house, and I don't want that. So let's talk about some of the hazards to birds. For instance, cats. Uh, if your cat is indoors, no problem. But once outdoors, cats have a predatory instinct that's directed at virtually anything living that moves. It might be insects, it might be chipmunks, or ideally it's uh, rodents. But birds are also very attractive. And People who've done studies feel it's one of the main causes of mortality in songbirds attributable to, you know, human introduced uh, elements in the environment. So wild, wild cats, feral cats, and domestic cats that are just let out to run are one of the major causes of songbird death. Hmm. And I've heard about those trap and release programs for feral cats. Yeah, birders are somewhat skeptical of that because uh, just to neuter the cat isn't doing anything at all to its hunting instinct. And even declawing cats, which I don't believe those programs include, uh, uh, are going to stop the cat from pinning, bird, pinning birds. I think there's a real conflict between birders and people who think uh, domestic cats uh, should be released into the environment. It's definitely not in the best interest of birds, in my opinion. So <clears throat> you already mentioned uh, keeping your dogs on the leash so that they don't scare up nesting birds. Or, uh, but deer is something you mentioned to me before the show, which w hadn't occurred to me before. A lot of people don't realize that most mammals will eat the eggs and the young of birds. So deer, chipmunks, Squirrels, certainly raccoons and opossums, are all known to eat the eggs and young of uh, birds that they find in the nest. Now, an adult bird can scamper away, but um, most mammals have that uh, taste for protein, I guess. And unfortunately, birds and eggs are a convenient source. Hmm. A lot of nature lovers love deer, but I think they maybe forget that um, the nat natural system depends on a balanced number of deer or not. Well, deer are very destructive to habitat. They eat out the undergrowth, the, the wildflowers. Um, people who've done studies have uh, looked at city parks, large city parks, where um, census has been taken of birds before deer are in any way controlled or studied. And then after deer are excluded, there's a dramatic increase in the number of nesting songbirds oh, really? that return to the forest. Huh. So you know, a few deer in balance are no problem. That's a part of it. But uh, if the deer get out of control, as they are in many suburban areas, including here in southeast Michigan, mm -hmm. it's really tough on particularly ground nesting songbirds, mm -hmm. like the wood thrush or oven bird or a number of other species like that. I've heard that deer like the fact that we create edges in the forest. We cut our subdivisions and things within the forest, and they like to have protection in the forest and then go out and graze and that cowbirds are another native species that has increased exponentially because of the, they've adapted really well to human development. Mm -hmm. um, what do cowbirds do that are hard on other species? Well, cowbirds are something of a unique species and they don't build nests. They parasitize other birds, particularly birds that are smaller than they are, whose eggs take longer to hatch and nestlings take longer to raise. Cowbird uh, female will watch, you often see them sitting up in tall st stakes watching for other birds where they build their nest. For example, the yellow warbler, a common warbler here. And when they see the nest, they'll wait till the yellow warbler finishes laying the eggs in the nest, usually uh, three or four or five eggs. They will then go in and flick out one or more eggs, lay their own egg in the nest. The cowbird egg hatches quickly, the young grows quickly, the yellow warbler somehow doesn't recognize hmm. that cowbird is not its own kind and it will feed that one in preference because it's bigger and more aggressive and so the result is typically the yellow warbler loses its own nestlings uh. and ends up raising another cowbird. Hmm. So if you create the kind of habitat cowbirds like that edge where they can sit up and watch the other birds nesting oh. in the edge it's very favorable for huh. cowbird I populations. wondered why they liked edges. That's interesting. Now they, they for example have been a problem in the Kirtland's warbler. Kirtland's warbler is Michigan's unique 
uh, species that at one time only nested here. And uh, one of the problems they felt with the diminishing numbers was the how plentiful cowbirds were in the mm. habitat. So now they have a program to actively control the cowbirds and Kirtland's warblers doing much better. Hmm. Great. Uh, wind turbines is another issue. How about the effect of turbines on bird populations? Well, in my capacity as the chair of the Hawk Migration Association, we're very concerned about this. Uh, raptors use wind currents to migrate makes it easier for them to go north or south on a prevailing tailwind. Those same windy corridors <coughs> are also very attractive to uh, people who are developing wind farms. Uh, and it isn't yet clear exactly what kind of criteria should be applied to wind farms to keep the hawks from running into the wind turbines. People have tried painting the wind turbines a color that's very specifically visible to birds. Uh, they've talked about shutting down wind turbines during periods of peak migration passage. But there's a lot of study left uh, to be made to determine really how you can have wind turbines and have a safe migration corridor for birds. And I don't think anybody really has clear numbers. It's probably true that um, collisions with towers and tall buildings, cats, automobiles are all bigger sources of mortality. But the way wind turbine farms are proliferating across the countryside, it's clearly an increasing hazard. Yeah, I just noted uh, statistics from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They said in 2009, almost a half a million birds died in wind turbines. So that's in one year, quite a few. It, it's a serious problem. And not just birds, but bats as well oh, yeah. are highly susceptible to They're declining to for other reasons. Yeah, yeah. That's right. How about your safe passage program? That's really interesting. Tell us about that. Uh, for a number of years now, uh, the Detroit metropolitan area, as well as um, urban areas around the country, have had campaigns to reduce the number of uh, lights in tall buildings above the fourth floor during the migration season, which in spring is approximately the end of March through the month of May. In the fall, right now we're kind of in the peak, August through middle of October, uh, because uh, birds typically use, among other things, starlight to navigate. And when they see bright lights high up in the sky at the level where they're flying at night, m many of them migrate at night to avoid predators, they get confused. And they will either fly into the lights or circle the lights. Think of a building which is a lighted column. The birds trying to keep the star in one position have to turn, and so often they'll end up just flying around a building in confusion. Like a moth, almost. Like a moth, in a way. It's, huh. It is very similar. And particularly on nights that are uh, cloudy, when they can't see the stars to sort of correct by getting a refixing, um, or when it's rainy, when the visibility is much reduced, they're drawn to this light. So it's tall buildings, and it's also communication towers, any high lighted object. So uh, you're trying to encourage people to turn off the lights between what t hours of the day? Um, peak migration is uh, typically between about 10 o'clock and 4 in the morning. So basically the, the nighttime hours. So save energy, save birds. Win-win. Yes, it is. It is indeed. So right now, for example, the city of Ann Arbor has a regular policy of making sure the lights are turned out. It's a very active group over in... Uh, in Southfield and the Detroit suburbs, it's working on the tall buildings in Detroit to suppress the amount of light that's um, evident to birds during the, the night migration. There's a neat video on um, the Washtenaw Audubon website, uh, the Safe Passage mm -hmm. um, page, and it's by FLAP.org. Yes. FLAP stands for um, Fatal Light Awareness Program, so people should check that out. Um, also, collisions on windows, what can we do about those? I mean, just your low floor, you know, when you have a picture window. I'm sure many of your viewers have th are thinking of that last time they heard a bird hit the glass of a patio door or a picture window. And what happens is the birds don't perceive glass. They see a reflection and think they're flying into the woods or into the garden. So the key to reducing that kind of impact and often resulting in death is to reduce that reflectivity. A screen in front of the window, oh. uh, strings or strips or some kind of netting, decals on the window, 
ways to define that window surface. Sometimes people say ultraviolet sensitive magic marker in a grid across the mm. windows. A grid that we can't see, but the birds can perceive. There's a lot of schemes. Again, if you look uh, on the Safe Passage website or the FLAP website, you'll see some of these ideas for what you can do with your own okay. home windows to reduce impacts. Great. And the Bird Center of Washtenaw can help people if the bird hits the window and it does not revive. So We tell people if they have a window strike and the bird doesn't look too damaged, uh, wait an hour and um, you can put it in a paper bag or a, a shoebox and if it's really raring to go, wants to get out in an hour, it's probably okay. If it isn't, bring it in. We have medication that both reduces inflammation on the brain and, and reduces pain. In fact, I want to give the uh, website for that. It's uh, www.birdcenterwashtenaw.org. Um, are there any other uh, resources that we should say we need to wrap up? I think uh, the um, uh, American Bird Conservancy, which is abcbirds.org, okay. is a great source for a broader set of conservation ideas, and they have pamphlets and brochures about many of the subjects we've talked about. Locally here, the Washtenaw Audubon Society, I think it's washtenawaudubon.org, okay. is a good website and uh, ways that you can find out about field trips and meet with other people interested in birds. Great. National Audubon Society, of course, is very concerned with birds. Our organization, uh, HMANA, Hawk Migration of North America, it's hma.org, has information about uh, raptor migration and raptor conservation. Great. Thank you very much. This has been very interesting. Thank you, Barb. You'll find links relevant to the show at ewashana.org forward slash greenroom. Thanks for joining us here in the greenroom.